Hi, this is Bob the Science Guy. As an active user of social media and a member of the YouTube community, I've been following the vaccine controversy for several years now. I believe a lot of this controversy can be attributed to a couple of factors. The first is a breakdown of communication between physicians and parents. The other is an explosion of videos on YouTube and other social media outlets that give people marginal or, or outright incorrect information about vaccines. And the third is, I don't think many people have ever had any experience with these diseases to understand the magnitude of the problem. Well, many of you may know me from my videos debunking conspiracy theories. I'm a working physician in internal medicine and the father of vaccinated children. While I don't have any ties with pharmaceutical companies and my practice is not involved in vaccinations, I am a strong supporter of public health. This support of public health comes from three experiences in my life. When I was 16 years old, my driver's ed partner, John, died of meningitis. In 1985, when I was working as a paramedic in Lansing, Michigan, I was called upon to transport a polio patient to Sparrow Hospital. We had to bring our medical supply truck with us and some teenagers because we had to pack up his iron lung and bring it with him to the hospital. And in 2011, my friend Larry, who was a 45-year-old investment banker in excellent health and a volunteer fireman, became ill in the afternoon and collapsed while playing hockey that evening. He died a week later at the University of Michigan Hospital of H1N1 influenza. As a physician, I have seen diphtheria, pertussis, and in 1996, I caught the start of an epidemic of rubella. These are all diseases that most people have never seen, along with measles, mumps, and tetanus. This is because we have effective vaccines to prevent them. While attempts at inoculation had been used before, Dr. Edward Jenner's in 1796 brought in the modern era of vaccination. Recognizing the similarity between the relatively benign disease of cowpox and the devastating illness of smallpox, Dr. Jenner used fluid from the lesions of a milkmaid to inoculate a boy against smallpox. His efforts were successful when the road to the eradication of smallpox began. Efforts to control smallpox in the United States were relatively successful. However, in 1959, the World Health Organization made an effort to eradicate smallpox throughout the world. Hampered by lack of money and vaccine early on, the effort was redoubled in 1967 with intensified vaccinations. As a result, the last known case of variola major occurred in Bangladesh in 1975. The last naturally occurring case of variola minor occurred in 1977 and a medical photographer in England was infected and died in 1978 at a research facility. Currently, only the United States and Russia have stocks of research-grade smallpox. The last known cases of smallpox in North America were in 1952 and in Europe in 1953. Smallpox was declared eradicated in 1980. Many of us in midlife bear the round scars of our smallpox vaccinations, and as a direct result, our children and grandchildren no longer live in fear of this devastating disease. As many of you may know, President Franklin Roosevelt was afflicted with polio. In 1938, he became the honorary director of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. School children throughout the United States began collecting and forwarding dimes to help fund its research. As a result, this institution was renamed the March of Dimes. In the early part of the 20th century, parents dreaded summer because with summer came polio. Otherwise healthy children would develop a summer flu. Paralysis could quickly advance, resulting in death, respiratory collapse, or paralysis. Nearly every family had a friend, a neighbor, or a child's classmate that was touched by the disease. One of the last major epidemics occurred in 1949, and entire hospitals were set up to deal with iron lung patients. These were uncomfortable and noisy, and your world became the reflection of a mirror over your head. Dr. Jonas Stock, who had begun researching polio in 1943 in North Africa, developed a vaccine using a killed virus in 1953. He tested this on his own family, and then it began widespread testing in 1954. 
Clinical trials of several million school children were carried out and the vaccine was found to be a success. Parents waited in line in front of public health departments to get the vaccine when it was released in May of 1955. The rates of polio plummeted and for the first time parents didn't fear the summer. In 1961, after trials in the Soviet Union, the Sabin oral vaccine, which contained a attenuated live virus, was certified for use in the United States. Polio was declared eradicated in the Western Hemisphere in 1994 and the Sabin vaccine was withdrawn from use in 1999. We continue to use a variation of the Salk vaccine to this day. So how do vaccines work? Some, like the Sabin vaccine, contain killed virus. Others, like hepatitis B, contain parts of the viral coat. These are viewed as non-self by the body, and an immune response is mounted against them. In some cases, an otherwise inert substance is added to the vaccine to enhance this response. The body sets up machinery to make antibodies against it. Once the flood of antibodies comes down, that machinery still stays intact in case the organism is ever encountered again. Once these antibodies are activated, your chance of contracting the disease is reduced but not fully eliminated. On a community-wide basis, this means that fewer people will harbor the disease to expose other people. This is also known as herd immunity and is one reason why vaccination is a public health issue and is equally, if not more, important than inspection of restaurants or clean water. As a result, many communities have passed laws to require immunization prior to attending public schools, and the armed forces of most countries immunize their troops. Broadly, there are three classes of diseases that we vaccinate against. The first of these classifications are diseases that will just simply kill you outright. Tetanus is a devastating disease that is almost untreatable and has a fatality rate of over 90%. Polio, of course, is a crippling disease with high mortality. Meningitis is a devastating infection of the brain and is very dangerous to college students and military recruits. The next group of diseases are those that have lower mortality but are extremely contagious and very dangerous to compromised individuals. Here in Michigan, we're having outbreaks of hepatitis A, pertussis, and measles. Hong Kong flu nearly took my mother in 1968, and it did take my friend Larry in 2011. Mumps is a leading cause of sterility, and pneumonia is extremely dangerous in the elderly and in children. Finally, we have the shingles vaccine. We have the HPV vaccine that reduces the risk of cervical cancer. And then we can have travel or location-specific vaccinations, with an example being yellow fever. The Center for Disease Control has developed vaccination schedules for infants and teenagers and even adults. There will be links for these in the description of this video. As I said at the beginning of this video, this is going to be a series. Each episode will highlight two or three of the vaccination-preventable diseases we're going to discuss vaccine side effects. We're going to talk about the hazards of not being vaccinated, such as this measles epidemic. We're going to discuss the risk of vaccination, both real and imaginary. And we'll also touch on autism. My belief is that education is key to a successful vaccination program for a community. I will take questions in the comments sections. And my hope is that by these videos, we can improve the communication between physicians and parents to enable parents to make good, informed decisions. I would also like to counter some of the obvious misinformation that is running around YouTube and social media. And it's my hope that you will find the series helpful. Thank you for your attention, and I'll try and get that next video out as soon as possible.